Okay, so I guess we'll do a quick, just an overview of what we covered last week for the, the two guys that weren't here uh, for last week. And of course, because this will be getting posted online, so it's nice to have a refresher, a carry through from the, the, the last lesson. Uh, my question for the night that I wanted everybody to think about while we're here was, uh, when in court, how can you prove you do not perform a function of government? And that's for summary convictions. So we'll see if anybody can come up with any decent answers to that. Maybe we'll write them down along with anybody's questions that they're going to have for later uh, if we want to talk about something after we go through all this real quick. So uh, we'll pick up from where I left off last time, which was uh, changing what I'm technically calling the legal person. Well, the, the, uh, I, I referred to it last time as a presumption of law, which it is, but people understand the word legal person better. So we'll start with the legal person. And the mistake people are making when they go to court is they think that the legal person is a new name just for them. Or it's something they represent exclusively or it's something that binds statutes to them or it's something bad that they don't want any part of or any other explanation that we've heard people come up with for a legal person. When really, all, in fact, what a legal person is, obviously it is, is its own identity. It's its own legal person. It has rights. It can own property. It can sell property. It can do anything it wants to. No one owns title to the legal person. Nobody. Because it is its own entity. You can't own legal title to something that's technically living. And the reason for that is there's about three main components that make up a legal person that are indistinguishable from one another when looking at just the legal person. Even the Supreme Court of Canada has a ruling. I've got it somewhere that basically the court doesn't see any difference between you the man and the legal person. You're one and the same. But that doesn't mean that you are the legal person. The reason they say that is because you make up a vital component of the legal person. And that's the important concept to understand there. Because the same way that corporations are created, uh, we're going back to trust law, which is what we talked about last time, but I'll explain it better this time in ways that everybody understands. And hopefully everyone's had time to reflect on that and get it more through their head, right? So where does the legal person come from? And you guys know this from last time that when you're born, particulars of a live birth is filled out and your parents and the government come together and sign an agreement that basically forms a new legal entity. So what they've done is your parents came forward as because uh, you're still a child and they are your guardians because you can't make decisions. They've gifted your portion of the Commonwealth into the whole trust of the Corporation of Canada. Right? So they are the grantors The grantor of essentially what is yours, your equity, your, your ownership of a portion of the Commonwealth, they gifted that to Canada, so which is just the big trust, if you want to call it that. It's a big corporation. It's a big trust. So with your parents as the grantor, um, grantor slash or slash beneficiary. That's why your parents get the uh, benefish. I'll learn how to spell. Beneficiary. Okay. So now we know the legal person is a trust, and we'll get into why it is a trust as soon as we get the roles all figured out first. Okay. So we know from trust law that there is always going to be a grantor slash beneficiary, and I've had people argue with me that the grantor and the beneficiary are two different parts of a trust. Okay, that, that's nonsense. The grantor and the beneficiary are the same person. Whoever puts the value in, that's who it's owed to. You can't get more simple of a concept than that. Okay, so the other two roles of a trust are the uh, trustee down here, and what's the last role of a trust? Okay, or in trust law, executor. Right. So this relationship created this guy right here, who is his own legal person. The grantor and the beneficiary, when you were age 1 to 14, was your parents. When you became 14, I believe, it doesn't really matter, it could be 16, could be 18, which is the age majority, but for the most part, 14 
I believe, is your act, the actual age you can start to contract at. I don't believe the 18 thing. There's a lot of biblical references to 14 and some other lawful references to 14, but for lack of even needing clarity, you, the man, at some point become <coughs> the grantor be slash beneficiary because everything that you own Everything that went into the legal person was yours by birthright. So that's what makes you the grantor and the beneficiary of everything in the legal person. All right, so now we're going to make the switch to corporate law, which actually mirrors, it directly mirrors trust law. And that's actually what a corporation is. It's a trust, right? They just call it something else to, to confuse people and get everybody walking into court and making ridiculous arguments. And it seems to have worked pretty well for about 2,000 years. So if this guy right down here is the grantor, and the beneficiary of a trust. If you were to switch this to the Dean Clifford Corporation, you gotta remember that's all lawyers do is they switch names around to confuse people when the names mean the same thing. We all know from Canadian law even that a corporation and a legal person are synonymous terms, they're the same thing. And it's the only thing a government can deal with. They can't deal with a man, so they had to make you an agent in commerce is probably the best word I've heard for it yet. So now Dean C. Clifford, the man, is the grantor and the beneficiary, but now we're talking corporate law. What would that equal in corporate law? What position would you be if you were the grantor, the guy that put all the money into something? Shareholder. 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 So. We know that I'm the shareholder now because I put all the money into something. I'm the one who gets all the dividends. I'm the, I'm the one that gets all the benefits. The corporation basically can't exist without me. That's why I'm an integral part of it. Who would, uh, what would an executor be in, uh, in corporate law? Anybody? Director. Be a director. Every, every corporation has directors, a board of directors, the people that set policy for the corporation. So you've got a director up here. And we'll just really quickly identify the other part. Who would trustees be in corporation of corporate law? Who obeys the policies of the policymakers? Employees. Employees. Isn't it nice how it even ends in two E's, both words? Trustee and employee. Okay. So we're just going to play some fill in the blanks here. So it makes the most amount of sense. So now if we switch trust law to corporate law, we come up with the, the, the most simple equation there is in law. Shareholder, director, employee relationship. That is a trust, period. So we know who these guys are already, but we'll get into that. How do we know who the director is? The shareholders have appointed them? Shareholders appoint directors. Correct. If a shareholder doesn't like what a director is doing, they have shareholders meetings. And shareholders vote, and shareholders appoint or remove directors from the board. So, well, we'll leave that position up there right now. So, you know right now that the shareholder of a corporation appoints the director, because they want to make sure the directors are setting the proper policy for these guys to follow, so that they get the maximum return on their investment. And that's how the flow works. So, the directors, set policy for a corporation, they tell the employees what to do, the employees carry out those instructions, and the shareholder receives the dividend. And that's the holy trinity. That's trust law, corporate law, that's the way the entire legal system works, period. He who owns the equity controls, period. You have final say in any, anything. So, if you were the shareholder, sole shareholder in a legal person because you're the one that put all the equity in, who would you want to appoint as director? Yourself. Probably yourself. I mean, uh, my grandfather always told me when I was growing up, if you want something done right, do it yourself. And in trust law, the grantor and executor can be the same individual. But we're going to find out actually any of these roles can be filled by anybody. It actually really doesn't matter. I think they're talking when they say that in the same capacity, you can be the same individual. But you can be any one of these if you're serving in different capacities. 
And that's when we get into the whole capacity argument that we'll probably hope to cover today. So Dean at a shareholder meeting, he's decided that he's about the only competent individual on the planet that can handle his affairs and his investments. So he appoints Dean C. Clifford as the director. Chairman of the board, president, CEO, um, I don't care what you want to call it. I'm the one who gives direction to the corporation now, legal person. So we're just going to put this back to legal person so that everybody doesn't get confused by that. Legal person. And we all know who the employees are. If this is a basically, for lack of a better word, if this is now a public corporation, and you and the government came together to form this, there's only one role left, and that's the government. And that's why they're public trustees or public employees. They're public servants. So what this means is, well, let's just stick with this for now. So we got government. <coughs> and government, well, employees. And that's exactly what they are. So that's the business relationship going on. Um, problem is, when they call this name, they know we don't know who we are in this equation. And because of that, that's how they screw us over and they get us into the role of the surety for the legal person or the person who's compelled to perform for the legal person. And really, there's only one role in this entire equation that's forced to, be, forced to perform for a legal person, and that is the trustees. They're the ones liable. They're the ones that are supposed to perform for this legal person. So what happens when we walk into court? So I don't think anybody's got any questions regarding that. It's all pretty simple, right? Pretty basic. No, it's not basic, but everyone remembers that from last week. Right. OK. So people show up, and they go to court when the legal person is called. Court's called. I'll have to rewrite the name, I guess. My, sorry, remember that for next time. So, court's been called. People show up for court, and they walk up, and you know, uh, I've heard the arguments, I'm not that person, or I'm not a corporation, I'm a man, and I have human rights, and every other argument the planet's made, and I've made them. You know, four or five years ago, it was the same argument I made. I walked in there, I'm not a corporation, I'm a man. You know? You can't, you can't charge me with that because I have rights and that violates my rights and blah, blah, blah and everything else. Well, that's not at all what's going on in the, in the courtroom. I've had even recently people that should know better have walked in and said, yeah, I'm here for that matter, which is a good way to approach that. And then they go on to say, I'm an agent for that person. Of course you're an agent for that person. Everybody in the courtroom there today, once that name is called, is an agent for that person. Otherwise, you wouldn't be there. You'd have no standing at all because the courtroom is nothing more than a hearing, a formal hearing where records are kept regarding this, this, this person right here, like the black book for a corporation, the minutes of, of a meeting. I don't even like to call it a boardroom meeting because if you were having a boardroom meeting, none of them would be there because that's only for directors. So a boardroom meeting would only have one person at it. I can have that wherever I am. I can have one right now in my head. I just did. I changed a couple of policies around for my legal person. It was pretty interesting. So, court's called. You go in there, everybody that is there is an agent for the legal person. As soon as court is, as soon as they, 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 they call the name, now that boardroom, if you want to call it that, or the hearing room, is being used to hear matters for Dean Clifford. If you're not an agent of Dean Clifford, then you're not there. You have no standing. Get out of there. They all do. And why do they all have standing for this person? And who is the government? The people. They're the employees. They're the public employees, right? They're the, uh, I like to call them trustees. I still like to call them public servants or trustees. So the hearing's been called. Um, actually, I don't even need to draw that part. Because what people have to, there's no point in even getting into the chart again. Uh, everything that people have to understand is and you can, if you read sections 32 and 52 of the uh, Charter and Rights and Freedoms, it'll tell you right in there.